Because Jesus has accomplished reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to pick up reading with you in verse 17. As Paul speaks of this reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Paul appealing to the Corinthians to turn their ear to him and his fellow apostles. To consider the fact that they are who they are in Christ because of them. Verse 17 with that in mind. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now let's, let's break that down. Verse 17. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is what? He is a new creation. What's happened? Old things have passed away. All things have become new. That man of sin who once lived that life where he was separated from God because of those sins. Now in Christ Jesus that we can access God's grace, access the blood of Christ and find forgiveness. Now that old life is now passed away. We don't practice the sin that we used to practice. The old man is dead. A new creation now has come. New life in Christ Jesus. So now the everything that concerns the life, the new life in Christ, that's the all things of the end of verse 17. All things concerning the decisions I make, the actions that I take, what my practice is now in Christ. All those things are new, and all those things are in God. Verse 18. All of those things that I do now, well, they're concerning what God's will is, what God's plan is, and what has God done? He's reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who made that reconciliation possible. Without Jesus, you know, there, there's nothing. There's only lost. But in Him we can be found. Now, I want you to see the first us in verse 18. I think that has to do with the anyone of verse 17. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Christ Jesus. That's the anyone who's in Christ. But the second us of verse 18 and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's the apostles. The apostles have been given by way of the Holy Spirit the ministry of reconciliation. That is, the apostles' message teaches us how we can be reconciled to God through Christ. Now, that word reconciliation is not something that we use a whole lot. So, for the sake of understanding what we're talking about, let's give us a definition of reconciliation. What is it? Reconciliation is just simply the restoration of a relationship to a harmonious state after a dispute. It's exactly what it is. It's going from a state of discord to a state of now accord with the parties that are involved. And you can very simply illustrate that. Just think that if you had a, uh, a, a mortgage with your bank and you'd been six months and you haven't been able to make a mortgage payment, are you in accord with your banker? No. I'm going to tell you, there's some discord there, isn't it? There's some, there's some problems there. And there's not a harmonious relationship going on with you and your banker or your, your person who is lending you that money and expecting a payment in return because you're, you're, you can't pay it. You're without. And let's just say someone else comes along, intervenes, and they take care of the balance that you owe. What has that one person come in and done? He's, a, he's caused a harmonious relationship to be restored between those two individuals where there was once discord, there's now accord. Well, that's what Jesus has done on a grander scale, hasn't he? Sin separated us from God. We were severed from fellowship with God, but Jesus came in, paid the price for our sins that we could not pay. We were bankrupt to do so. Jesus has done that now, and those who come to God through Him can now be restored to God in a harmonious relationship. What was once in discord is now in accord. That's what Jesus has done. Now, if you look at verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to Him, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That is, the apostles have that word. You want to know how to get to God? You want to know how to be in a harmonious fellowship with God? Well, listen to the apostles and what the Holy Spirit has spoken to them, what has been written down and preserved for us. We obey that message, then we can be in this state of reconciliation. And we can know that Jesus now has, he has 
paid the price for our sin, and we've accessed that by faith through obedience to the gospel. And our sins are not being imputed to us. That is, they're not being put on our account. Jesus took those on Himself. If we have come to God through Him and found that reconciliation, that's why we can pray to God. If Jesus had not become our reconciler, we'd had no way that we could go to God in prayer. But since Jesus has accomplished what He has accomplished, then that is why that we can pray to God. Secondly, since we understand why, let's talk about how. Well, how can we pray to God? How is it then that, I, well, I know that, that Jesus has made it possible for me now to have fellowship with Him. I can now share in a relationship with God, but how is it specifically that I do that? Well, we're not talking about what, what we need to say or, or what our prayers could consist of. What we're talking about is the, the means by which this is accomplished. Well, the how is just like this. Our reconciler has become our intercessor. Jesus is our reconciler. He's made the reconciliation. He's made the, the harmonious relationship be available to us. But when Jesus came, lived that life, died His death upon the cross, rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, He took up a different role. Redemption has been accomplished. Now He's taking up the role of intercessor. And Jesus is interceding on our behalf. Well, what do I mean by an intercessor? Just talking simply about one who petitions or entreats God in favor of another person or persons, as we're talking about in our case. That's what Jesus is doing for us. Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of God, having paid the price for our sins and reconciled us to Him. He's now sitting there entreating God in our favor so that we can have this relationship continue with Him. You see, it's not just a one-time thing, is it? I think too many times some of us think that. that okay, I've come and I've obeyed the gospel. I was baptized into Christ. All right. Well, I, I've done it. <laughs> Well, this is a continuous thing. We have to maintain our fellowship with God. And that's important. Baptism into Christ is the beginning. But we have this life that we have to continue to live until our death or until the Lord comes again. And Jesus is there facilitating that continuous relationship because I don't know about you. Well, yes, I do. I do know about you. And I know about me. We all make mistakes. And we all continue to have a sin problem as we live throughout these lives. And if you're, if you're one of these people who's a dedicated disciple of Jesus, you don't want to practice sin. You want to try to keep it out of your life, but sometime it arises. And sometime it overtakes us. And what we need is we need someone interceding for us at God's right hand whom which we can come through and find access to God's grace again and find forgiveness. That's what Jesus is doing for us at God's right hand. Hebrews chapter 4. Turn with me there. Let's talk about the interceding work of Jesus. At the end of Hebrews chapter 2, the discussion of Jesus being our perfect high priest, perfect faithful high priest is coming to the discussion. This discussion is picked up again in chapter 4. You, you understand the, the high priest. Yeah. The high priest of the old covenant would have been a man appointed by God who would intercede on behalf of the people. He would be the go-between between between the people and God. The high priest would go in once a year, take the blood of the sin offering into the Holy of Holies, and offer that blood for atonement for the sin of the people. He's the only one that could do that one time a year. And that would be the way that atonement would have been made under the old covenant, which it wasn't really reaching atonement in reality, but it was pointing us to that which we now have in Christ, what Jesus has accomplished, our perfect high priest. And that's where the writer to the Hebrews picks up at chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. I want to take this verse by verse, one at a time. Who is our high priest? Jesus is our high priest. What has he done? Has he gone into the tent of the tabernacle here on earth somewhere? No. Jesus has passed through the heavens. Jesus left earth, ascended back into heaven, and He's there in the heavenly holy of holies. He's there in the throne room. And since that's the case, since we have that type of high priest who is above and beyond any earthly high priest could ever be, then what we need to do is we need to hold fast our confession. What confession is that? That's the good confession that we read about in the New Testament. That's the confession that we made when we came to Christ and we obeyed the gospel before we were baptized. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
You've got to hold on to that confession. Because why? Because Jesus is that one. He's our high priest. He's interceding for us. And don't think that Jesus doesn't know you and doesn't know me and doesn't know the life that we're living. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. What kind of high priest do we have? We have a high priest who can sympathize with us. He's been here. He's faced the difficulties that this life can throw at you. He knows the temptations. He knows all of them. He knows how weak mankind can become because He's lived among us and He's walked in our shoes. Jesus did it perfectly. And we can't. And He doesn't sympathize with our sins, but He sympathizes with our weaknesses. He knows that we fall into states of weaknesses from time to time. And when we're weak and we need to come to God and we need to find help, Jesus is there to intercede and say, I know what they're going through. I've been there. Let's help. And that's why verse 16 says, Therefore, look, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We all have those times of need, don't we? We all have those times. Let me ask you, how is it that I, standing on this earth today, can come boldly to the throne of grace? I can't ascend up there. I can't fly up there. The only way that I can go and implore the Father when I need grace and I need mercy and I need help in my time of need is to do so in prayer. And what the writer to the Hebrews is saying is when I need to come to God in prayer to find this help and this grace and this mercy in this time of need, I have an intercessor there who knows what I'm going through. I have an intercessor there who knows about the temptations and the trials and the difficulties and Jesus has passed through the heavens. He is the Son of God and the Son of God is sitting at God's right hand and He is interceding on our behalf. And therefore, I can have confidence to know that I can go to God in prayer and I can find the help that I need. Why? Because it never ends. Look to the seventh chapter with me. Going back again to the example of the earthly high priest, you know he only lived so long. And then what would happen to him? You'd have an earthly high priest, and you know someone may like that guy. You know, he seems to be a really good high priest. Well, guess what happens to him? Eventually he dies. And another high priest would have to be appointed. And that process continued over and over and over again. But the point the writer of the Hebrews is going to make in chapter 7 is, is that our high priest now, under this covenant, he never dies. Picking up the thought of his priesthood again in chapter 7 and verse 24, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. You don't have to worry about the priesthood of Jesus coming to an end. We know Jesus is this perfect. He's this completely superior and an effective high priest that meets every one of our needs. But I don't have to worry about a time coming when he's not going to be there. Because he's always going to be there because he always lives. Verse 25, therefore, because of that, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Jesus can save completely. Because He's always alive, interceding for us. And there's nothing that Jesus can't do. He's always going to have exactly what I need to maintain my fellowship with God. So I can know that when I come to God in prayer, if I'm doing my best to practice righteousness and be the disciple that the Lord desires for me to be, if I am that person, then I can know that when I come to God in prayer and I've got a moment of weakness, I need help, I need to find grace, I need to find forgiveness, I can know that when my prayer goes to the Father, that it goes through Jesus and Jesus is always going to be there and He's always going to communicate to God exactly what needs to be done. And what can I find? I can find grace. I can find help. I can find mercy in my time of need when I cannot do it for myself. But Jesus can. And He's always going to be there to make intercession for me. Chapter 10 really continues that thought. Turn over with me to chapter 10. Chapter 10, picking up in verse 19. We have this idea again of of this confidence that we can have to come to God. Those of the old covenant who served God under that covenant, under the law of Moses, they couldn't draw near. 
Only one person could draw near, and that was the high priest. And his work was insufficient. But what we can do now is the very opposite of that because of the high priest that we have now. Look at verse 19 of chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, we've already read that in chapter 4, haven't we? Let's work this backwards from verse 23. What are we going to hold fast to again? We're going to hold fast to our confession. What's our confession? The good confession that Jesus is the Son of God. I am going to hold to that. I'm going to glue myself to it because I know that it's true. And God has promised us through Him. And God is faithful to keep those promises. Faithful to keep those promises to whom? At the end of verse 22, it's those who have been baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. Because that's the moment when we come into contact with the saving power of Jesus' blood. There's nothing else in the New Testament that corresponds to what the end of verse 22 says except water baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And those who have done that, they can draw near to God because their souls have been purified in full assurance of faith. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to worry if you have some access to God. No, he says you can be fully assured of your conviction in Christ, holding on to that steadfast faith because you are in Him. And because you are in Him, what can we do? Do we have to draw back? No, verse 20 says that we can draw near. Why can we draw near? Because we have a high priest over the house of God who has made possible a new way. The old way you couldn't draw near, but now you can. Why? Because we have come into contact with the blood of Jesus. We have found salvation in Christ. We have fellowship with God. Therefore, what can we have? We can have confidence. The idea of boldness here is just that. I can be confident when I need to go to my God in prayer. Will He hear me? Can my prayers get taller than the ceiling? Can they actually go up to the throne where I need them to go? What's the answer? The writer of the Hebrews says, yes, yes, and yes. Why? Because Jesus, your reconciler, has also become your intercessor. And He's always going to be alive. And He's always going to be there. In His superior high priesthood, interceding for us and doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And while we're here, the only way that I can approach the heavenly holy of holies is in my prayer to God. But I have a mediator there. Sometimes we need mediators, don't we? You can think of so many relationships or so many times in life where a mediator is absolutely necessary. I think one that we would all understand is our young kids go to school. I mean, I mean, some of our kids, a lot of our kids go to public school. And it may be that we find out that our kids in public school, maybe one of the schools that some of our kids go to, we may find out that they're not being treated the way they should be treated. They're not, they may be mistreated for some reason. I mean, that's not the case. At least I don't think it is. I hope it's not. But if that's the case, if we find out about that, our young kids can't go to the principal's office and, and, and speak on their own behalf adequately because they don't have the experience and the ability and the wisdom to do so. But what can mom and daddy do? Mom and daddy can go to the principal's office, can't we? And we can go sit down in the principal's office and we can mediate on their behalf, can't we? We can be their go-between because they can't do it on their own. They're not equipped to do so. And I hope responsible mamas and daddies could go and do that. But you know what I can't do? I am not adequately equipped. I am not able. I am so weak and so frail. And so without the wisdom and the ability to approach my God by myself, to find what I need in times of need, then I can't do it alone. You know what I need? I need a mediator. I need an intercessor. Who is that? Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is that? That's the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
Those two passages speak to what we've already talked about. The last of that verse, verse 6, talks about his reconciliation work. He gave himself as a ransom. Why? So that we could be reconciled back to God, which was, was in discord at one time, can now be a harmonious, harmonious accord. We can be in fellowship with God now. And now since we are in fellowship with God, what do we have there at God's right hand? We have a superior high priest, an intercessor. We have a mediator who has all the wisdom, all the ability, and all the knowledge and understanding of who we are to intercede on our behalf and mediate for us successfully so that we can go to God and find what we need. Always. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's a wonderful thing. And the only reason that that can be done is number one is the why. It's because Jesus made that possible through reconciliation. The how is because that Jesus is interceding. And certainly we understand how important that is to each of us who are in Christ. So if that is the case, and it certainly is the case, then shouldn't it be easy to understand Why my prayers should be prayed in His name? I didn't come up with that on my own, by the way. Go to John chapter 14. Those of us out here in the John class, we we were able to talk some about this, but not as much as we needed to. We may appeal to layer, but I certainly wanted to take another one. Prayers to God in Jesus' name is what Jesus taught the apostles. John chapter 14. Jesus now speaking to the eleven because Judas has gone away to do his work of betrayal. But notice that Jesus is trying to give them more instruction before His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Notice what He says in verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you. Now I want you to gather the context. Who's the you here? The you is the eleven. So Jesus is saying to the eleven, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, that he who believes in me is among the you. The works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So Jesus is telling these men who were going to take up the work of reconciliation. He tells them, you know, what his point is, is I've got to leave. I've got to go back to the Father. And these great works that you've seen me do, well, you're going to do them too. And oh, what great things they had seen Jesus do. They've seen Jesus raise people from the dead. Could you imagine in their wildest dreams that they by themselves could raise someone from the dead. But you get to Acts chapter 9, and what do you find Peter doing? He's raising Dorcas from the dead. But what does he do? I believe it's in verse 40. What does he do when he puts everyone out of the room and he kneels down? What does he do when he's, before he says, Tabitha, arise? He what? He prays. He prays to God. And Jesus is saying here about what that's going to be like. Yeah, you're going to do great works. You're going to do them in my name. And whatever you ask in my name, you'll do it. And that's obviously exactly what Peter was doing in Acts chapter 9 when he raised Dorcas from the dead. But how were they going to do it? When they came, when they appealed to God on behalf of whatever they needed for themselves, who were they going to ask in? By whose authority were they going to ask? Jesus said, you'll do that how? In my name. Go to chapter 16. John chapter 16. Let's pick up the same thought in verse 22. Again, Jesus is trying to prepare them. Guys, you don't really understand what's going on, but I'm I'm getting ready to die. And I'm going to leave here. And you're all going to be so sorrowful. But that's going to change. Look at verse 22. Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and uh, and your joy no one will take from you. When was that going to be? Can you imagine when they actually did come to their senses? 
that Jesus is alive. I mean, right after he rose from the dead, they're still trying to figure out some things. They're still in a state of confusion in regard to a lot of the pieces of the puzzle. But can you imagine when they figured out what was actually going on? And they realized what Jesus had accomplished and what this is going to mean for the entire world, not only themselves. What joy they could find. And no one could ever take that joy away. Why? Because Jesus is alive. And not only has He reconciled, but He's interceding continually forever. What joy? No one can rob that joy as long as you stay where you need to be in Christ. Look at verse 23. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Do we understand what Jesus is saying there? Up until this point, how were they able to go to the Father in prayer? It was only because Jesus was praying to the Father Himself. And Jesus was going to the Father on their behalf. I'm going to have to pray for these guys because these guys aren't in fellowship with God. So Jesus was doing it. But He says when that time comes, that time when I die, I rise, I ascend, you know what you're going to be able to do, guys? You're going to be able to pray to the Father yourself. I'm not going to have to do that for you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name at the end of verse 23, He will give you. You haven't been doing that now, but that day is going to come when you're able to do that. If you ask the Father anything, 1 John 5, 14, according to the Lord's will, if you ask that in Jesus' name, you'll get it. That's what He tells us. But how were they to ask? Drop down with me to verse 26. In that day you will ask in my name, And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father Himself loves you because you have loved me, and I have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. That's exactly what we're talking about. Jesus says, look, I've come. I'm getting ready to finish this part of my redeeming work, but I'm going to have to go back, and I'm going to go back to the Father. And when I go back to the Father, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to go to the Father in prayer if you do it in my name, and you'll be able to receive what you're looking for. But in whose name? What did Jesus teach about prayer? You may be saying, well, you said this was in the context of the apostles. I sure did. But Jesus also told the apostles in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, they were to go out and the disciples that they made, they are to teach them the things that He commanded them to do. I want you to look at an example of Jesus' prayer in John 17. Verse 25. And I want you to, to, to just try to the best of our ability to be able to hear God the Son in His human body knowing what He's getting ready to go into. Can you hear Him praying this? O righteous Father, the world has not known You, but I have known You, and these have known that You sent Me. And I have declared to them Your name, and will declare it, that the love which You have loved Me may be in them, and I in them. And that was going to be the case, and it was the case, and there was going to be one day soon when they would pray to the Father exactly like that, and they would be heard. If they did that in Jesus' name. Because that's what he said. There again, if you're wondering if this has to do with me and you, it most certainly has to do with me and you. Can I give you a familiar passage up here on the screen? Colossians 3 and verse 17. After in verse, or the whole of chapter 3, if you will, Paul is talking about where our focus should be as disciples of Jesus, not on this earth but on things above. And he goes through that whole chapter talking about what our lives should be generally before God. Not just in worship, but all life. And he goes on to say, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do in word wouldn't be all encompassing of prayer, but prayer would certainly be a part of it, wouldn't it? And how are you to do that? In the name of Jesus with His authority, 
But even the last part of that verse speaks to what we're talking about as well. Giving thanks to God the Father, how? Through Him. And do we see that even in our prayer life, when we're, we're praying in the name of Jesus as He taught us to, we're being reminded of how important Jesus is to us. What Jesus has accomplished for us. That He's the one who reconciled us to God. He's the one who paid that price for sin that I couldn't pay and I was bankrupt to ever do. He's the one who's now mediating for me at God's right hand so I can maintain my fellowship with God. That's what Jesus has done for me. That's how much He's loved me. And every time, everything that I do, whether it's in word or deed, let me do it with the authority or in the name of Jesus. And most certainly, Jesus taught, when you go to your Father in prayer, that important avenue that you need to communicate to your God, because of what God has done for you and you know that God is there and he's, He wants to help. And when you understand the importance of this, you can speak to God and you can pray and you can know you can find what you need if you do it in the name of Jesus because you know you're going to the Father through Him. I just think that's a beautiful picture. And I think sometimes we forget about that when it comes to considering our prayers before God. So very simply, as we consider what we've talked about tonight, whether it be that you're a man and you're praying in our assemblies or our Bible classes, or you're a man and you're praying over the meal, or you're a, you're, you're a lady who's praying, or a, whoever you are, man, woman, boy, girl, if you're in Christ, and if it's a public prayer or a private prayer that we need to make to our Father, it needs to be in the name of Jesus. How do we know that? Because one of the very Godhead Himself, God the Son, said that it was to be that way. That's when your prayers are going to be adequate. That's when your prayers are going to be heard. We're going to God with the authority of Jesus because Jesus is the only reason that we can do it. Without Him, my prayer can't get any higher than this ceiling. But in Him, I know through the veil that is His flesh, because of His blood that I've accessed, I can have confidence to know that if I go to my Father in His name, I'll be heard. And I can find grace and help in my time of need. I'm so thankful for that. What about you? Let's just remember how Jesus taught us to pray. And let me leave you with this. If you're here tonight and you're not in Christ, that is, if you have not repented of your sins and been baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, God's not hearing your prayer. You can pray all day long. And it's a sad thing that you're not in fellowship with God. I mean, you may be to the point where you're accountable and you know that you need to obey the gospel and you just won't do it. But you still pray to God asking God for help and asking God to do this for you and that for you. But understand, if you have not come to God through Christ, there's no fellowship there for your prayer to be heard. But we don't want it to continue to be that way and I hope you don't. We're appealing to you tonight to access the blood of Jesus through obedience to the gospel. And we stand ready to help you. No matter who you may be. As I've already said, every person in this building is subject to committing sin. There's not a perfect person in here. The perfect one is sitting at the right hand of God because we need Him because of our sinful situations. Y'all don't forget that. There are going to be times when we're weak and we fall and we need to seek God's forgiveness. Thank God for Jesus who makes it possible. You may be here tonight and you're in need of, of forgiveness. Why not seek it while you have the opportunity? Whatever your need may be, we stand ready to help you. Won't you please come while we stand and we sing this song?